Yes. Uh, um, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Ham Radio Network. Um, we're very excited about uh, this evening's um, Zoom session. Um, excited. Wow. Very excited. <laughs> um, this is an evening with Steve Shorey, G3ZPS. Um, and the topic is old ham gear. Why do we bother? Um, I'm really excited about hearing about this. I'm hoping I'm going to hear something about Klansmen because I've always wanted a Klansman um, and maybe that'll feature in it. So um, with great pleasure, I hand it over to you, Steve. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, let's just um, go through the sharing. You've The host has disabled screen sharing at the moment, whoever you are. It's on. Okay, stand by one. Right, can you all see that? Yes. Fine. Well, uh, good evening, Ham Radio Network. Uh, I think I've presented once once here before. This has been a very uh, popular talk. I don't know how many times I've given it now, 30 or 40 maybe. Um, I'm Steve Shorey, G3ZPS. I know there is a uh, couple of other G3s on this call. I've got David, G3WGN, and Peter, G3MLO. Uh, I'm one of the youngest G3s. Um, it's not a reissue. I've had this course on since I was at school in 1970. And the G3s will know um, that the G3 call signs ran out at ZZZ, so not long after me. I was desperate uh, when I was at school to get a G3 call because there were all the people I heard uh, on the radio when I was a kid. So um, I got in there very, very quickly um, by pirating on the key. Uh, mainly. <clears throat> so um, we won't talk about that. So there aren't many G3s younger than me. There are a few, but I've only ever worked five or eight. Um, so I've been licensed for 53 years. I'm not even 70 yet. Um, 69. So um, and so my, uh, my background is um, I'm a professional engineer. Uh, I was trained by the MOD. Uh, then I moved on to the police to re-engineer all the comms networks. I think that's a talk I've given to you before. Um, I'm a fellow of the uh, of the IET and a member of Cray Valley. My friend Dave is on. Cray Valley is one of the biggest clubs in the southeast. We are um, uh, just the one club with uh, over 150 members uh, at, at Cray Valley. So we're doing very, very well in the London area. One of the biggest. Um, I've spoken at a lot of clubs online and um, and in person over the last, especially over COVID online. Wow, I speak loads. Um, uh, this is really from a bit of a UK perspective. I see that Robert KA0WTK was on the call. I have given this talk in the US where I've given it more of a US flavour, uh, but this is pretty much um, a sort of my, um, my, uh, my take uh, from a UK perspective. I can't mention every old bit of hand gear. Uh, so if, if I leave out some of your favourite old gear, I'm sorry, but there just isn't, isn't time to get it all in. Um, I've got about 40 stations restored at the moment in my workshop down the garden. So I've been at this uh, fairly long time. So just a bit of a, a, a warning, really. Um, I don't know if any of you uh, do get involved in any sort of um, nerdy collecting. It doesn't have to be ham radio. It can be anything you like. There seems to be a nerd for everything. Uh, but the health warning for, for ham radio is um, if this is your ideal shack with your icon, whatever it is, 7300 or whatever that one is, uh, and a laptop, uh, and a power supply, and a lovely desk, uh, then perhaps you can go and make, might be an idea to go and make a cup of tea right now, because um, you might want to look away, because things can get pretty out of order. That isn't my garage. Um, uh, it might well be if I don't tidy it regularly, but um, uh, if you get really uh, caught up in this collecting line of ham radio gear, then... Um, um, you can get into some serious family difficulties. This is a um, cartoon from an American magazine. Greg's gone to the ham auctions. She says to get rid of a couple of old radios that were clearing up the place. Oh, there he is coming in out of her eye line. And Greg's come back from the Dover rally or wherever uh, with, uh, with even more stuff. So, um, and if you get really bad, you could end up like George, W9EVT. This is George. Uh, his museum, for want of a better word, 
is bigger than my entire property and I've got a big garden. It's absolutely massive. I think he's in uh, north, of, north of New York. Um, he's got a room for every every make of uh, 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 of gear, absolutely staggering. How he keeps it all running, I have enough trouble. Um, what his electricity bill might be, I've really got no idea. So um, if that frightens you, pop out and make a cup of coffee. Um, so inevitably, um, um, and, and talk of any old hand radio gear, uh, um, we have to talk, valves are going to are going to uh, um, feature in the discussion. So it's just one slide here, really. Um, valves were around uh, from well before the First World War, uh, but all the development of the way they work, the different aspects of them, the science of just about every aspect of, uh, of valves and all their uh, uh, different flavours from diodes to triodes to pentodes to you name it. That, that research and um, understanding of how they worked and what you could do with them was pretty much all undertaken between the wars. Uh, and there's um, a little nod up there to a valve called the EF50, which is the subject of another presentation, which is a valve that featured heavily in uh, helping uh, the UK uh, in the Second World War with uh, radar. So valve technology moved really, really quickly between, between the wars up to, uh, up to the beginning of the Second World War. Um, and broadcasting took off, 2LO here in the UK, different in the US, uh, but um, and some of you may have, worked, may have worked GB100 BBC last year. Uh, the BBC um, company, not the corporation, that changed a bit later, but the BBC um, company started uh, 100 years ago last year, and you might have worked my mate Jim off of Radio 4, uh, G4AEH, Jim Lee. Uh, I've worked in quite a bit at GB100. So uh, just for a golden period, um, we, uh, Radio Hands back then, uh, we'll give the run of the of the higher bands because it wasn't really they weren't really well understood and uh, deemed to be pretty much useless and just for a period we had the run of uh, of quite a lot of uh, the hf spectrum but immediately it started to uh, show some use short waves whatever you want to call it um we were pretty much partitioned into the uh certainly the hf frequencies uh, that we know and love uh, we know and love now um Spark, spark disappeared, although it was still lurking around, but the, the, the radio valve, there it is, the valve or the tube for our American friend uh, on this call uh, is uh, on the uh, uh, leaning against the ropes because it's knocked out the spark transmitter. So uh, about 1922, that's from an American magazine. So um, radio hams are off and running. Um, into the 30s here in the UK, and this is a bit of a UK perspective, there wasn't a great deal of off the shelf Ham radio gear. Uh, we'll talk about that um, in a minute. If you uh, if you were going to be uh, if you're a radio ham in that period, um, you uh, were going to have to you could buy the parts. But in this country, you were pretty much going to have to assemble your station uh, from uh, from individual parts. And I have threatened over three years now, and I've never delivered on it that I would dress like Gerald Mark Hughes. There he is, G two NM. Um, I'm not sure if you had to dress like that back in the day. Uh, but you know, it looks 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 pretty good, doesn't it? So you know, there's no purpose-built ham radio kit that he's bought uh, anywhere. It's all assembled. So it was a sort of golden age of of experimenting. So as we uh, as we move into the uh, into the thirties and we start to look at some of the gear that uh, I've been lucky enough to own and, and restore, something sort of popped up fairly early on uh, in my research for this um, this presentation. This is an advert for the Shortwave magazine. Um, not sure of the year, 1936, 1937. Um, and it's an advert for a company called ACS Radio, G2NK. And that, um, that, uh, uh, that, that address, Widmore Road, Bromley, is right around the corner from where I live when I became G3ZPS with my parents. I lived in Bromley in, uh, in Kent, up here in, in North Kent. Um, but something interesting uh, pops out. Uh, there's the uh, Hallicraft's uh, Sky Buddy. Um, uh, there's um, an RME 69. Uh, but something interesting pops out when you look at this. Um, it says, get to know a fine range of communications receivers in Bromley, in Kent, just on South East London. Um, but you look at all these, um, all these, oh, that's my national NC100. That's, um, that's mine. 
uh, my uh, radio taken down my workshop uh, last year. But you look at all these radios and there's something rather, uh, rather uh, interesting about them. They're all American. They're all US. So just before the um, uh, Second World War, uh, in the mid, mid, uh, mid 30s, 1936, 1937, if you wanted to buy a communications receiver, uh, this company, ACS Radio, a decent superhead comms receiver, um, it seems to be you were going to have to, uh, certainly the choice was, was limited to US. There were regen radios and simple radios that you could buy, buy in this country and kits and stuff, but, you know, top quality communications receiver superhead with all the bells and whistles, they're all, um, they're all, um, they're all American. And of course, the price for some is quite high. I'm not sure if the nine pounds is correct. If it is, it's quite cheap. But you look at the uh, the amount of uh, disposable income that, you know, middle income earners had in this country. And a lot of radio hands in this country back then were young people, even teenagers. Um, you know, that's quite a lot of money, 26, 35 pounds. It's quite a lot of cash, uh, especially if you're uh, going to ponce it off your parents. It is it's a lot of money back then compared to the uh, the average uh, monthly wage. So certainly from ACS radio, all American, all American receivers. Eddystone came came in just um, uh, just literally before the Second World War, they our March 1939, um, with their uh, ECR, the first Eddystone, the Eddystone communications receiver. And there it is by now, a proper uh, British uh, superhead communications receiver. And it reads great, you know, um, all the spec reads absolutely brilliant because the 33 megs, um, it's got all the uh, all the toys you would, you would hope for for a, a decent comms receiver at that period, but it's 45 quid. So um, as far as buying one for your ham radio station just before the war, probably pretty much out of the question for uh, for a lot of UK, uh, a lot of UK hams. So the American stuff does pop up in this country from time to time, it's quite popular. You uh, will come, We'll come in a couple of slides time to why there's so much of it here. Um, uh, and it, it's, uh, it's relatively uh, simple in modern terms. And you can see all the components, they're nice and large. However, the world changed, as we know, all of us uh, in uh, 1939, uh, the Second World War uh, started. And whilst comms gear and uh, radio had been used in the First World War, uh, the Second World War was pretty much the first sort of the, the global conflict where communications and technology would play such a big part across all the theatres of war and the Axis and the Allied powers. Communications became an absolutely critical part of the of the whole business of waging war, um, and each uh, of the uh, armed forces had slightly different requirements. And again, this is more from a UK perspective. You've got the army and the the infantry. Uh, you've got the Navy uh, and their ship, uh, shipboard communications, and you've got the Air Force uh, aircraft, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, uh, fighters and bombers in this country, uh, with their uh, separate uh, communications requirement. And the radio requirements and needs were, um, were different. Um, uh, and what happened, and I talk about this frequently in these talks, uh, the result uh, the Second World War on this particular technology that we're talking about was that there was an absolutely massive uh, research development production leading to a tremendous diversity of equipment which wasn't there uh, in the 30s. It's just st staggering. The whole machinery of R&D manufacturers swung into action and the pace was absolutely breathtaking. Uh, the amount of gear and all the support uh, equipment and components that went with it. The actual production was just uh, absolutely astounding, which led to some rather interesting developments for us uh, 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 after the war. Uh, young people, especially, who wanted to get into uh, get into the hobby of ham radio. Um, so after the uh, after the war uh, and the massive uh, R and D effort of uh, of communications equipment. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the the pace of development meant that a lot of the uh, a lot of the equipment developed quickly went out of date uh, as we uh, as the uh, research and development into better forms of communications gear moved forward very very quickly, and what that led was to a, a huge amount of 
components, modules, and complete transmitters, and receivers, and spare parts uh, becoming available on the surplus market immediately after the uh, immediately after the war. Um, it, the trickle turned into an absolute flood, uh, which kept going for something like 25 years, certainly well into my uh, uh, schoolboy period in the 60s and into the 70s before it started to dry up a bit. Um, and you could get hold of some great stuff. Um, a new word sort of entered the lexicon uh, uh, a little bit later, which uh, related back to some of this kit that we're going to talk about. And, th and that word um, uh, is uh, boat anchor. There's a lot of the wartime kit that we're going to talk about uh, was uh, extremely heavy. It was built to, uh, you know, withstand some pretty um, heavyweight punishment. Um, uh, this term bow tank uh, uh, sort of uh, is, is generic now for uh, all sorts of old gear. So I, I, I think uh, it, it, it sort of permeated the whole world. And I was very interested to find out where the term bow tank, and we'll talk about that radio in a minute there at the bottom bottom line anchoring down that boat. And I wonder where it came from, this, this, this word, because we're going to look at a lot of bow tankers in a, a few slides time. And this is what I found in my research. In 1956, the American magazine CQ, um, and I don't know if this is a genuine letter or whether it's a letter that the editors made up and then, you know, answered themselves, you know, like fake news. Um, but apparently, you know, a reader asked about converting wartime gear to amateur use. And they put this rather cutting uh, reply in, uh, which um, basically says, you know, put 100 feet of Melilla line onto your old heavyweight bit of uh, wartime surplus radio gear and then anchor your boat. Uh, and I, don't, I have no idea if it's genuine. It's in that 1956 issue of CQ uh, magazine, but it's stuck. So just about every, you know, when you talk, hear people talking on the forums about uh, about old, uh, old gear, even not, not necessarily uh, uh, wartime surplus, the term bow tanker is sort of uh, the sort of stuff. If anybody's got a better view of where it came from that they can find, then tell me. But uh, so the sort of kit that became available uh, to us, um, which uh, I've worked on and played with, was uh, was fantastic. This is uh, one of the most famous. Uh, uh, transmitters and receivers, uh, military bits of kit of, of all time. Uh, the, it's called the 19 set. Some of you will know about it. Some of you may not. Um, made uh, in, in a number of different countries with different variants, quickly developed through the war, different uh, Mark I, Mark II, Mark III. Uh, about two to nine watts out. Uh, could easily be converted to run AM on top band 80 and 40. Um, and huge numbers made, uh, dirt cheap, which we'll see in a minute for an advert, but now highly valued, uh, used uh, into the 50s and for cadets um, uh, in training into the 70s. Um, uh, interesting, I was even talking about some of these this evening on 40. I randomly spoke to a bloke on 40 this afternoon, and he started talking about some of this kit weirdly, not that he's going to be on this call, uh, G4, G4F. Uh, station started talking about so I'm going to talk about that later on, uh, Bob. Um, this is a 62 set. Uh, again, these all came available on the surplus market just uh, you know, in the 50s and the 60s. And they were cheap and they were great for us, some of us, uh, because they were um, they were plentiful. You could get inside and you could be on the air pirating or, or not if you had a license very, very quickly. Um, actually, the, we spoke about this on the radio earlier. This is an 18 set. A uh, little transmitter and receiver, easily converted to 40 meters, runs about 250 milliwatts. So all of this gear became um, available and at a very reasonable price. This is an advert from John's Radio in Bradford. If you go back through old shortwave mags, you'll find all these adverts. And you can see over there, uh, four pounds and 10 shillings, which is four pounds 50 in new money. Um, and um, it says brand new in box, I think, somewhere there. Brand new in box. You know, where have they been storing all this stuff? But, uh, you know, if you could tap up your parents for a fiver, still a lot of money in the um, in the uh, 60s, uh, but a few paper rounds. You know, if you could tap up your parents for a five or six pounds, you could get 
uh, this in your bedroom with loads of wires of a cerebral power supply. Uh, probably very dangerous. I don't know how I didn't die back then of electrocution, but you could buy this kit and uh, you were on the air, um, fine on top band uh, or 80 meters. Um, absolutely fantastic, you know. But, if you can, uh, but now hundreds and hundreds of pounds, though, even not working, people will buy them to put in their um, World War II. Uh, uh, jeeps for reenactors but absolutely incredible uh, really if you could just borrow borrow the money off your parents you can buy this kit um we haven't got time to talk about green radio what somebody said uh clansman obviously as, as all those 19 sets went out of uh use uh in the, in the military uh things uh, were upgraded quickly the next the next uh, uh series of radio certainly for the army was called um, larkspur and then after that, um, uh, a Klansman, uh, uh, which is now on the surplus market and the, the PRC, so the, the, the Klansman uh, um, uh, transceivers. Um, after Klansman, we moved on to Bowman, which is more digital and will probably never come onto the surplus market. Uh, and that will even move on to the a next generation called Morpheus. But this is this has sparked a whole generation, probably more from the Larkspur stuff in the 50s, um, which is uh, amusingly uh, colloquially known as green radio. It's a whole um, there's a whole range, a whole presentation in itself. But there are enthusiasts and VMARs, the Vintage and Military Amateur Radio Society, who just love green radio and everything to do with the, this sort of gear from the uh, the 50s and the 60s up to Klansman and love it. Um, as far as restoring it goes, you need to know what you're doing. It's hermetically sealed a lot of it and connectors and that are not, uh, are not um, anything like, you know, simple hand radio stuff. Uh, but there are there are um, a number of, uh, of real uh, green radio nerds around and that's this could be the subject of an entirely separate presentation. But the, uh, the, the 40s and 50s stuff that I just showed you, the earlier stuff, easy to take apart, easy to get on the on the air. Sadly, just very expensive now. So I'd love to have a 19 set here, uh, but uh, I'm not going to pay hundreds and hundreds of pounds for one. Um, the Navy, uh, there's some great bits of kit that came available on the surplus market. This is a CR100 receiver, an old design. Uh, but after the war, they... they um, uh, had a couple of different names, a shipboard receiver. Um, uh, uh, this this is the real um, the real bow tanker. Certainly here in the UK, uh, the uh, the B forty from about nineteen forty nine, made by the Murphy Company. And where weight is not an issue on the ship, if you uh, if you get hold of one of these uh, in the sixties, a great receiver. That's the, the thing about some of this old kit is. As far as AM and CW goes, it was quite adequate at the time and quite fun to use now, um, quite stable. The only problem with this Admiralty B40, um, it, well, there's several problems with it, but one of the most uh, problems is the weight. We talked about things weighing, you know, upwards of 100 pounds, but if you look here, uh, what does it say? Yeah, there it is, 114 pounds. So... One or two of my friends had these in the late 60s because you could pick them up. Here it is, 22 pounds, a bit more pocket money. You'd have to have slightly, your parents with slightly uh, more uh, open wallets to uh, to buy a, a B40, 22 pounds 50 back in the um, 60s, late 60s. Quite a lot of money if you bring that money, you know, inflation now. And your parents would have to uh, really... Uh, Really love you dearly to cough up £22.50. One of my friends in Orpington, a G3Z, his parents did, and he had one of these B40s in his bedroom, and I just thought it's the coolest bit of kit. It's a great receiver. Um, but just taking it out of the case is a, is a trial because of the, you know, it's, it's a, the weight is, um, is so great. Um, and I did worry about the rafters in his house uh, because, you know, uh, again, it's a, a real heavyweight bit of kit. So that's the Admiralty B40. The um, Air Force, so the kit that they used in the Second World War, that quickly came onto the surplus market as well. Loads of us uh, in the uh, 60s and into the 70s used this receiver, the 1155. There are others, 
and I can't go through them all, but the uh, great shortwave, you know, or normal shortwave receiver, um, they made huge numbers of them. They were made by a number of different companies. They uh, mainly used uh, in aircraft before they uh, before they uh, uh, became uh, obsolete. Uh, and this is a typical installation in a British bomber. Doesn't have to be a Lancaster, but there were a lot of the Lancasters had them. There's the receiver at the bottom, and the transmitter at the top. It's a T1154, so you got 1154 and 1155, uh, and they're very collectible now, which means these days you pay quite a high price for them. Uh, even just the coloured knobs uh, seem to go for quite a lot of money on eBay. Um, uh, and they came onto the surplus market in, in, in quite large numbers. Uh, uh, coming over from the US, I think it's one US station on the call, a number of different manufacturers uh, made little things that I, I really loved called command sets. Uh, transmitters and receivers generally working in fairly narrow narrow bands are so not general coverage um, and intended for shorter range comms uh, in uh, in American aircraft, but quite made by quite a few different companies. But they came over here and were converted by, uh, you know, by uh, 60s uh, uh, radio hand schoolboys mainly, I think. And I love them. I remember my friend's brother, who was a G3, had one um, transmitters and receivers, and I really like them called uh, command sets. And here's an American um, is an American, a picture of an American bomber, you know, contrast that with what's a fairly simple layout in, in, the, in the Brits, British bombers, but for probably only operating over Europe. But you look here, the amount of kit this guy's got, he's got the command and receivers and transmitters at the top. Uh, and he's got a, a, a receiver in front of him. And he's got a college transmitter at the bottom. We haven't got time to go into details about all of this stuff. Uh, but I'm amused by the fact that he's got a 1936 Ford ashtray, which is on the left, second hut from the bottom. Uh, and if I had all that kit, to, you know, uh, to keep keep control of, then I'd probably be smoking quite a few fags as well. So um, that's just, um, you know, uh, a shot of the sort of complexity of the comms installation uh, at that at that time. And of course, again, after the war, all of this stuff started to come into the, uh, the surplus market. So um, there was a shortage of British receivers, as we spoke about um, uh, before the war. And once, the, uh, once we were uh, embroiled in the Second World War, it became absolutely clear uh, to the British government that communications, um, listening to uh, uh, access communications, and of course we, we know a lot of us about um, Enigma communications and Enigma encipherment from... Uh, uh, from uh, uh, from German and its allies, that we just did not have the amount of kit. They just didn't have it. They didn't for some reason. I've never got to the bottom of why we didn't get into the production of of uh, decent comms receivers. The only thing to do was to bring it in from the US. Bring the kit in. The wonderful uh, and heavyweight boat anchor AR88 is one of the most famous of the period. I've had two of them. I've got one at the moment. Amazing mechanical and electrical performance, something in the order of 25,000 made. Loads and loads of them uh, came into this country for use in uh, listening stations. Phenomenal uh, mechanical anti-backlash, spin the dial, and it's a joy um, for those of us that love that sort of thing. Um, I used one for years when I was a teenager working CW on top band. And I thought I could hear the electrons bouncing off the area or such was the, the uh, performance of the AR88 that I had, which had a couple of mods on it. But I worked all my top band DX on CW uh, with uh, an AR88 as, as the receiver. Um, and we brought loads of them into the listening station. Some listening stations uh, have banks and banks of them. If you've been up to Bletchley Park, the Computer Museum, not Bletchley Park, They've got a, a Y intercept station mock up there with racks of uh, AR-88s, you know, with the cases off mounted in racks. Uh, and I still use, love playing with mine. It's in one of my sheds. Fantastic receiver. Uh, and we bought in loads and loads and loads of them. And you won't be surprised to hear that uh, the ones that didn't use were came onto the surplus market. I don't know how many didn't. We seem to have um, even 
stored ones that weren't used uh, until after the war. Um, I like a, a film clip. Uh, uh, well, I'm not talking to you um, in, in a room. I normally ask where this film clip is from. It's from Help. And I was watching it because I'm a musician and a guitar player and I was watching the film for some other reason. And I fell about laughing. My wife didn't know what I was laughing at. There's an AR-88, George Harrison sitting in front of an AR-88. There's Roy Kinnear and, uh, and Paul McCartney on the left. I fell off the seat. There's an AR-88 in the Beatles film, Help. So there they are uh, in, in, the, uh, in the 60s, late 60s. 75 pounds. Now you've got to cough up some cash if you want a new one. Um, 75 quid. I think they ended up at 87 guineas towards the end of the 60s. But it says brand new. Where have they been? I don't know what they've been doing with them, but yeah, brand new IR88. Uh, both of mine are second hand. I'd love to have had a brand new one back then. But a lot of money, fantastic receiver. But now you're into serious money. And um, I don't know many uh, schoolboy friends that can tap up their parents for. Uh, for 75 quid but if you could again watch out for the rafters in your uh, in your bedroom mine are, mine are in a shed my one's in a shed uh, and i can tell you just getting it out of the case is uh, is a bit of fun because you know the weight the weight comes out with you uh, and you've got to be prepared for that those big transformers in it but not a complicated receiver beautifully made if you if you've got any experience with that sort of gear um uh, not not hugely complicated but um uh, just absolutely beautiful bit of kit uh, the other receiver which uh, uh, we brought in in their uh, hundreds uh, in the second world war was this the national hro national radio company in america uh with its rather unusual uh, dial and plug-in coils uh uh my uh, i have uh, a national radio in my collection uh, we haven't got time to go into great detail about them, but you need to plug in coils and you need a graph to tell you what frequency you're on. Uh, but again, we bought in loads of them and their variants uh, during the war, uh, possibly on a lease lend arrangement, I don't know, but we bought in a lot of them to use in, uh, in their listening station. We just didn't advocate ourselves. And because we bought so many, they've, they came onto the surplus market and still pop up at rallies. I saw one at the Canvey rally about uh, a month ago. I think it was three or four hundred pounds with a few coils. So they, they're not outrageously expensive, uh, National HRO, and not hugely complex. So we come out of the Second World War and all this kits are floating around. Um, and some other great stuff started to appear in the 60s. This is a Rakel RA-17. Um, Rakel, Ray and Cal in the 50s started Rakel up. Uh, the fledgling small company in West London, uh, somehow or other, I'm not quite sure how they did it, managed to get a government contract to supply high quality communications receivers to the government. Um, they didn't really have a design early on in the early uh, 50s. Uh, and they, they tried to um, tap up an American company to have their kit made here. Uh, but that fell through and they were left uh, scrabbling around to build their own communications receivers. And they came up with um, an arrangement with um, using a, a, a design of a topology of a radio by a guy called Trevor Wadley, who's a South African. And he had a drift cancelling uh, topology of a receiver. Uh, and if any of you have owned an FRG7 back in the 70s, or uh, and there were a couple of others, um, Drake certainly made one, where you set the mega cycles with one dot knob, and then you um, you scan across the naught to one thousand kilocycles with a second a second uh, a second uh, knob. Then this was that's about the earliest incarnation. That almost all valves uh, RA seventeen, uh, a bit of a beast, heavyweight, and rather complex mechanically. Just getting the front panel off is a tribulation in itself, but very stable, very popular were quickly updated, loads of them came onto the hand market. Uh, and Rakel went on to make some absolutely fantastic gear, uh, synthesized uh, receivers, transmitters, a whole range of, uh, of commercial gear grew out of this, of this company. Um, for a while, it was an absolutely classic British electronics company, sadly all broken up now into, uh, 
into different parts and, and uh, under different umbrella names, which is a, a great shame. But uh, I know a few people who collect these receivers, not that easy to work on. A lot, again, a lot of the modules are sealed and you really, um, not for the faint hearted to restore, are much more complex than some of the stuff we've, earlier stuff we've looked at. Yeah, and a six foot film strip that you spin for your, uh, your killer cycles for you as you scan from uh, uh, across a whole one megahertz range. Uh, I love a film clip. Uh, and there's a whole load of RA-17s there. Look at them all, fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. I wonder who took that picture of all those RA-17s. Well, you might have guessed it. Uh, they are RA-17s, well, well, the front panel of RA-17s, but they're from Doctor No, the first James Bond film. And if you watch it and you stop frame it, uh, you'll see uh, the listening station, the command station in London. It will go to that picture behind there and... Uh, there's all those, uh, apparently, they, they saw just the front panels off. Some of the time the first Bond came, Bond film came out, those 50s RA-70s were uh, were no longer uh, current uh, uh, current uh, military uh, or government uh, bits of kit, and again, on the surplus market. So we've talked pretty much uh, about uh, 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 sort of comms kit, uh, that uh, you could buy bits of uh, and get yourself on the air and buy now if you've got the money because a lot of it's become more collectible. Uh, but we're moving into the second part of this presentation, which is about ham radio kit, buying something and plugging it in and getting on the air without having to pull things to pieces, get your hands dirty, nearly kill yourself, uh, or you know have this tremendous weight sitting in your in your bedroom. Um, and things started to change in the 40s and the 50s as we came out of the war and uh, around the, certainly in the Western, in the West, uh, uh, radio homes were getting a little bit older, uh, a little bit more disposable income and a range of companies started to tap into a market where you could go and buy something and plug it in and get straight on the air. Initially, the Americans were pretty, uh, were, were, uh, were first. Uh, and the Brits followed on a bit later. So we're talking about the Americans first. Collins, here he is, Art Collins, W0CXX. Uh, Collins started to make ham radio off the shelf ham radio AM CW equipment before the war. Not a great deal of it appeared over here in the UK, but in his domestic market, uh, he was making ham radio kit for American hams. Um, and he set very high standards in terms of the. Uh, design, the functionality, and the manufacturing and the quality. Um, and that set him on a, on a course where he would become an absolutely critical supplier to the US military. Uh, and he, he became, uh, his company became uh, one of the largest uh, suppliers and communications kit to the US military, if not the largest. Um, after the war, uh, as that sort of requirement sort of faded slightly, Collins went back to uh, making ham radio gear for the domestic market and a little bit of it started to trickle over here into the UK. Not much. He made some great receivers and he started to, uh, he started to use some uh, real innovative, uh, uh, innovative design aspects. Uh, this is his 75A series. This is the first one. It says here for the DX Hound, fantastic receiver. Not seen many here in the UK very high quality. Uh, he decided he wouldn't use a VFO with the capacitor. I won't bore you with the technical details, but he used a slightly more complex arrangement called a PTO, which is where you have a coil and a slug that moves up and down inside it to change the frequency rather than a capacitor. You get a much linear uh, arrangement. Uh, and um, if it's mechanically well-made, extremely stable, and a very accurate readout. Uh, not many made it uh, into the UK. But Collins, uh, in 1955 or the early 50s, saw this uh, new, it wasn't a new technology, single sideband, it wasn't a new technology, but uh, he realised, um, or the company realised that SSB might have a future of more portable um, or, you know, not huge rack mounted uh, bits of kit. SSB had been used in the 30s and the 40s, but single sideband, as far as you know, smaller bits of kit was concerned, 
uh, he thought this could be the future of HF communications. Um, and in a demonstration to the US military, uh, he, uh, he got support um, to move from AM to SSB. SSB, as we know, if you've got the right stability, uh, uh, is, is uh, quite an improvement on the AM, 9 or 10 dB better. Uh, and the military were convinced by his demonstrations and he immediately started to embrace SSB, uh, both in his commercial HF aspects for the military and in ham radio as well. Um, it's difficult to sort of realize now uh, we're all, you know, I wasn't around, but the, the, uh, the change from AM uh, to SSB in the 50s when HF conditions were absolutely phenomenal. I mean, good these last few weeks, but imagine that, you know, even better than that in the 50s when there were loads of people on and suddenly this new you know, Donald Duck um, uh, technology appears. It must have been, there must have been, all hell must have broken loose, but, you know, Collins was, was in there. Uh, and he started to produce some fantastic uh, single sideband gear. This is a receiver, the 75A4. And uh, this is a transmitter, the seven, uh, KWS1. In fact, this is part of the transmitter. The actual, uh, the actual rest of the transmitter is in a rack. I uh, can't remember how high it is, uh, four or five foot rack. This is just the control deck of the transmitter or the, the, R, the, uh, the, the, the sort of R, uh, part of the RF part of the transmitter. Uh, these have become known in, uh, in recent years as the gold dust twins because they're the sort of uh, the holy grail of, uh, of that period of, uh, of early SSB uh, uh, transmitters and receivers. Uh, and there's a few people in this country with them. They were tremendously expensive. The KWS one in 1957 is in shortwave mag, and it wasn't far short of a thousand pounds in 1957. That's 35 grand in today's money. There are a few people I know with um, a few videos knocking about, one or two guys who were millionaire radio hands, and they bought this kit. And I know of a few people in this country with these two bits of kit. Uh, but uh, you won't see many of them. But uh, GW0ROW had a bit of an idea, apparently, he worked for Collins, and, it, and, it, and his idea, I'm simplifying it a bit, was if both of these things have got a VFO or a PTO, and if both of these bits have got, have got a carrier oscillator, or you can call it a BFO if you want, and if both of these have got a, a heterodyne mm -hmm. crystal which sets the band, uh, then why do you need two of them? Why do you need one in each box? Why not put the whole thing into one box? Uh, and he demonstrated it to Art Collins, this idea. Uh, and Art was impressed, apparently. And um, they, uh, Collins brought out this. The, uh, was it the first the SSB single knob transceiver? I'm not sure if it was the first, but it's certainly one of the first and one of the... the um, the most well known. The KWM1, about 1957, there is one in the radio centre, the RSGB radio centre up at Milton Keynes. Um, a one knob, um, a one knob SSB transceiver. So no more two great big boxes, but now condensed into one box. This is a ham radio one, and you can see there on the left, it covers uh, 2015. A it must be a commercial, 18 megs must be a military uh, band in the US, uh, and uh, bits of 15 metres and uh, bits of uh, 10 metres. Uh, actually, only covers 200 kilohertz, I think, of each each crystal band. And there's a reason for that, but we good time to talk about that. <coughs> um, and they even, uh, uh, colleagues even, uh, um, uh, advertise that you could use it mobile. Um, I'm not sure it would fit into your Ford Anglia back in the day, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, you could buy DC power supply and now you could run an SSB transceiver. Must be quite a thing back in the day. Apparently, maybe my American friend on here could give me the call, but there is an urban myth on the internet, and I believe everything I read on the internet, uh, that when Gary Powers was shot down uh, in his U-2 spy plane in 1960, that there was a KW M1 uh, or, or in the aircraft, probably a little bit hard to believe, but um, I love those little internet stories. And apparently it was on, I've got it written down, there's a secret CIA frequency. Collins moved quickly to um, really come up with something sexy 
Uh, and here it is, the KWM2 SSB transceiver. And there's a reason I'm showing this transceiver, which we'll come to in a couple of slides time. So now they've taken the thing um, and more and made it look a little bit yes, less utilitarian in its square box. And they came up with this wrap around with a, a two-tone gray light bezel, darker wrap around the hinge lid. Uh, and they, uh, again, uh, amateur and commercial, the KWM2, sorry, 2A SSB transceiver. Uh, the 1959, something like in the region of 30,000 made and became pretty much a benchmark for uh, SSB transceiver at the time, professional quality, um, could be used military and amateur, but expensive. You could buy them in this country in the 60s, this Collins KWM2, and we'll talk about the, it's, um, what it expanded into in the next slide. But it's very difficult to find a price because in all the shortwave magazines, it's normally price on application. There was a shop in London, uh, in um, northwest London that I went to. Um, but there was no doubt at the time, there is no doubt that you were talking over a thousand pounds, possibly 1500, depending if you bought a power supply with it. Uh, again, the affluent uh, 60s older radio hands could afford it, did buy, um, uh, did buy the gear. Um, but it, it set a benchmark for the way it looked as well as the way it performed. Uh, Collins then broke out uh, separate receivers and transmitters, which they called the S line, uh, and became a whole range of gear that's inside the KWM2. If you really uh, want to uh, see inside one, um, and they broke it out into tra separate transmitters and receivers, uh, which they called the S line, and they're all followed in this wrap round sort of sexy style. And they advertised that it could even sit, you know, in a, an American lounge on the coffee table because. It was off the shelf. You bought the power supply and the transceiver or the separate receivers and transmitters. No wires, no military surplus kit. You could, um, you could, uh, you could have the complete station on a beautiful uh, stained uh, table. Uh, you know, look fantastic. And they, they, um, uh, they uh, quickly expanded. Uh, I like Collins kit. The real difficulty here in the UK, uh, and uh, quite a lot of it was used in Europe when the Americans were uh, big in, in Germany after the Second World War in the 50s, quite a lot of it turns up in Friedrichshafen. The big issue with Collins kit, every one of these bits of kit we're going to talk about for the next few slides has got an issue, uh, a specific issue about restoring it and rebuilding it. Collins kit is not tremendously complicated, but the big, the big uh, thing with it is the price. <coughs> the price of buying it and the price of buying any parts for it, any knob, a beta, a switch wafer, anything specific to a Collins bit of kit that you can't adapt from somewhere else, you know, resistance, capacitors, valves, that's all fine. But uh, anything else uh, is the price. And that is really what puts, uh, uh, put, has put me off uh, uh, of uh, doing an awful lot of Collins kit is, is the, uh, is the uh, the price of, of any damn thing you want if you break a knob and you want an original one uh getting one from the us is expensive anyway in postage at the moment uh, and in import but it's just the cost um i like a film clip uh, and here's doris day i like doris day um and she's in a film called the glass bottom boat uh, which is a spoof sort of spy film. And a stage husband, I think, um, or film husband, he might have been a radio ham, or somebody on the production was a radio ham and tapped up Collins to uh, to put, uh, to have some of their kit uh, in, in the, the film Glass Bottom Boat. If you feel you want to watch it, you, you stop frame it in the right place, it's a Collins radio kit in it. So a company that I do have a lot of gear from, uh, Robert Drake. Uh, here is W8CYE. He also spotted that SSB is the, was the future in the 50s, 57 of HF ham radio gear. And it wasn't AM, it wasn't great big boat anchor AM bits of kit, but SSB was going to be the future. Uh, and he wanted, um, while he was unwell, because he didn't, his company was not doing that well in the 50s, he became unwell. Uh, and while he was at home recovering, he uh, designed uh, an SSB receiver. Uh, and he thought it was great, uh, and he wanted uh, another company to build it. Uh, but none of the American companies 
uh, that he contacted Haviland or Hallicraft or whoever, they wouldn't build it. They were still locked into their their bigger boat anchor and receivers running their own design team. So he only had one option, and that was to build it himself. So he did. He built it, and the Drake became a radio company, as well as other things, became a ham radio manufacturer as well. This is it, Drake 1A. Some of the Americans call it the, the American letterbox. You know, the letterbox with a little flag on it outside your house. You see it move as if you haven't been to the US. It's that sort of, it looks like it should lay flat, but it, it sticks up. I have seen, I don't know one, I have seen one in Friedrichshafen, but they wanted too much money for it. Uh, and it was a success. Uh, he made them and a couple of outlets bought them and he was off and running uh, to the extent that he quickly then moved on to uh, designing more and more kit. Uh, again, we haven't got time to talk about all the Drake kit. Um, but he, he, uh, his, his pre-owned gear of the time was called the Four Line. Uh, this is a transceiver. I've got four of these Drake TR4 transceivers. Uh, they're very lightweight, very powerful. A lightweight because there's no power supply built in. Power because they use um, American uh, deflection tubes from color TVs, uh, which means uh, they. Uh, uh, they can run a fair amount of power. They're easy to damage if you don't look after them uh, called sweep tubes, but um, they can run a fair bit of power. I have four of these transceivers um, and I absolutely love them. Uh, compact, very good performance. Uh, 300 watts input. I get over 150 watts out of mine easily. Uses a PTO, not a VFO, so you've got one kilohertz readout. Uh, uh, still expensive in the UK, but nowhere near as... Uh, as expensive in Collins. So this stuff started to appear uh, in the UK in the uh, mid 60s. Uh, this is a separate transmitters and receivers uh, called the B line that's sitting on my dining room table. I've got them here in the shack uh, and uh, they're upgraded again to a thing called the C line, which looks very similar. Just again, little updates in, in, in uh, the technology, uh, but pretty much uh, based around valves, which Ultimately, it was a, uh, became the downfall of the company because in ham radio terms, because they stuck with valves well into the 70s when they should have uh, they should have moved to transistors. They did eventually, but not quick enough. But for a for a period, this was fantastic kit to have if you were a 60s radio ham. I've been lucky enough to pick it up fairly cheaply in the last 20 years, although it's getting more collectible now. Uh, celebrity user of Drake gear, uh, there he is, King Hussein, JY1, uh, back in the 70s. Uh, quite a few of us uh, hankered after working, King Hussein of Jordan, and you can see he's got Drake gear there. In fact, he used a lot of Drake gear, even the, uh, the, uh, the seven-line Drake gear, which is transistorized and came after the, uh, the valve gear. He used that as well. So um, I like Drake. Uh, but they rested, they re rested their, their, uh, their, their reputation rather too long. I've got a completely separate presentation about KW uh, Electronics, which is a British company for anybody on, on the call. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I think there's at least one US station on here, but KW is a British company of which I am very well acquainted with because they were just down the road from where I live. I know lots of people who work for them. I don't know a lot about the company uh, and it's... Uh, employees. I didn't work for them, but I know lots of people who did. And I used to go there as a kid. My mate lived just down the road from them, literally just down the road. It's literally a mile from here, all the KW kit. So I won't go into a great deal of detail. I've got a separate presentation, which I'm not sure if I've given to you guys. I don't think I have called the history of KW electronics. Uh, Roly Shears, G8 KW and Ken LS G5 KW are the uh, people that founded this company after the war. Both of them had an interesting war, which we haven't got time to talk about now. Uh, Rowley became DARC member number one in Germany for some of the stuff that he did post-war. Again, another presentation, we could talk about it. Uh, Ken Ellis uh, was uh, big into VHF when nobody was back in the 40s and the 50s. And he, uh, after the war, developed a close working relationship with Saudi Arabia as a, a communications consultant. And he did some clever stuff and they awarded him the Royal Roads and Dagger, which is like an honor. Uh, so Ken and Rowley started KW in 1956, really uh, much the same as the American, uh, like Drake, they wanted to make hand radio gear that you could just buy 
put on a shelf. They saw this market developing along with other British manufacturers, which we haven't got time to go into, but they saw uh, this potential to, um, to sell a ham radio kit. And they started um, with um, uh, AM gear. This is uh, most famous, one of their most famous transmitters, a KW Vanguard, initially as a kit, uh, but then uh, made in Rowley's shed uh, as a complete unit. And the whole idea was to come up with something that would be cost effective, undercut any competition from Europe or the US, uh, that you could just come down there, down here in Kent, go and buy or buy a kit and build it. Uh, they moved quickly on to making receivers, which is KW77. I, I have all these bits of kit. Um, and I also saw K uh, SSB as a future and started to make separate transmitters. This is a KW Viceroy. Uh, I've, got, uh, I've got all of these. Um, so they, they stuck with the AM, but they saw that SSB, like Drake and Collins, was going to be a thing. Uh, so they started making separates. This is separate, just a transmitter. I can tell you there's a lot of air inside the box. Um, so it's still a sort of a bow tanker design. However, somewhere along the way, they saw the KWM2 uh, Collins and um, they decided, I'd love to have been in the room when they did it. They came up, uh, somebody must have had a bright idea. Could we make a KWM2, Collins KWM2 transceiver? using the same topology, this is important, exactly the same frequencies, not different, but the same, but cut everything down to the cheapest that you could get and make it up here in Dartford uh, and make a, a, a transceiver at a price which would way undercut the competition and be an SSB transceiver that you could buy a stick on your desk in 1963, 64. This is the prototype. I know we know it's a prototype because we've got access to the photographer that took the picture in 1963-64, literally just down the road called Woods and Porter. So this is their prototype uh, and they came up there. Everything is cut down. So it's close to the KWM2, but much cheaper. There's no CW filter, there's no mm -hmm. AM. It's got a very poor dial readout, no PTO, nothing clever, just a simple valve, VFO. And it's got one filter in it. It's a mechanical filter, not Collins. They couldn't, they had to buy these mechanical filters in from Japan called Kokosai Mechanical Filters, 455 kilohertz, SSB bandwidth. But they did it. They got the whole thing down. Um, everything was cut down. Everything was cheap. Uh, and they did it. And they brought out the uh, KW2000 uh, and quickly, uh, uh, upgraded it to uh, an A and a B and an E between 1964 and 1976. This is the most famous one, probably the B. Uh, it had top band, it had a uh, clarifier tuning, uh, not brilliant readout, uh, better than the earlier versions. This again, this is on my kitchen table. Uh, they offered them a, a much, a very reasonable price, a couple of hundred quid, 220 pounds, and a great customer service. You could drive here to Dartford, pick up your KW, if you had a fault, you could drive here, drop it off, go for a coffee, and Rowley and the team would attempt to repair it while you had a coffee in a local topping shop. Um, and a lot was sold here. They were sold in Canada, not so much anywhere else in Australia, but fantastic. And did you, uh, can you notice the styling? Rowley clocked onto that, that Colin styling and he copied it. So it's got the wrap round bezel, it's got the two-tone case, it's got the flip up lid, it's, it's exactly like the Collins, and it's got the same sort of sexy look as the Collins. Uh, and he called it the G-Line, uh, but the S-Line G-Line, I don't know why G-Line, the G-Plan furniture here at the time. Uh, pretty good performance on the best, nice styling, and 6146 output valves on the Collins, the nasty sweet tubes, which um, Roly really hated, uh, and top band, which was big here in the UK. And best of all, way, way, way much cheaper than US gear, way cheaper. Uh, and he really uh, pushed the boat out. It was a commercial company as well, KW. We made a lot of other kit as well. And I'm not sure how radio kit made him a lot of money, but he also branched out, made a mile from me. There it is. That's the factory just down the road here. Literally, you can see, uh, see the area. So I used to go there with my mate Paul uh, when I came to visit him. I lived in Bromley. Um, and if you bought a shortwave make back then, 
they went, they again, they opened the whole thing out. They started making receivers. They started making linears, which have survived. They started making separate transmitters, uh, all relatively easy to repair until recently, relatively cheap to buy. Starting to get collectible now. Um, the only real drawback with, with KW gear is very, very simple. is this damn mechanical filter. The mechanical element inside is packed in foam. And over the 50 years since they were new, the foam has degraded to this, turning them into a yucky, horrible mess. So you have to take them apart and clean them. It's not electronics. Your hands are all brown. You have to use methylated spirits. If you're lucky and the wires are not broken or the, the filter's not damaged, you can wrap it in new foam, put it back together, and you've got a brilliant mechanical filter back again. But it's the downfall of KW gear is this, uh, is this filter. So very quickly running uh, through the last uh, sort of 10, 15 minutes of this presentation here, uh, again, from the British perspective, uh, Eddystone were a fantastic company and sold loads and loads of receivers, ham radio and, uh, and commercial. This is um, uh, and highly collectible. They're pretty highly collectible now, not all of it, uh, but there are a whole range of collectors in this country who love Eddystone gear. Think about Eddystone is the dial. You spin the dial and the pointer whizzes across on the flywheel and it's very satisfying uh, to use. Um, yeah, the fabulous slide rule drive. They made huge range of receivers from domestic to stuff on, on liners and ships, all the way through to synthesized stuff into the uh, 70s and the 80s. Um, pretty well built. And some of the early ones were live chassis, so you watch out for those. Uh, Eddystone's downfall in the end was it never seemed to make anything for very long. They just got a new order, new development, and then they quickly moved to a, another variant of a receiver. And they had a very ever-changing catalogue. Uh, and again, it's a downfall of a, of a great British company. Uh, but some of these uh, valve receivers from the uh, 60s and the 70s uh, were, were uh, still are quite prized possessions. This is the, one of the most famous handband receivers, the EA-12. A couple of my friends have them, I don't. And they made little comms receivers like this, the EC-10, uh, which are quite cute and people love uh, cute things, don't they? Small things, easy to repair and work on, lightweight. Uh, I love a film clip. Uh, there is a KW on the left, the Vanguard, and an Edisto receiver on the right in a film. And yes, it's Dr. No again, if you watch it in the beginning, I think it, uh, the, uh, the agent in America, in the Jamaica, I think it is when she's calling London, she gets shot, but that's the kit that she's using. So both KW and Edison have got their kit into Dr. No and Rachel, they're all in there. And if you zoom in on the uh, KW Vanguard, it's on 20 metres, bit of a poor choice, poor choice for, for, for James Bond to be on, on 20 metres. Um, can't go uh, for, again from a British perspective without talking about Kodar, the Kodar 85. There it is, little very simple top band and 80 meter AM and CW transmitter. If you look at it, this on a big screen, then the transmitter is bigger than what you can see on the screen. It's not a very complicated thing. Loads of us copied them. Very simple, neat little modulation scheme. Uh, but um, in a way that no KW never made anything. Kodar made these with a little DC inverter and he could run them in a car mobile with a, a little receiver, which wasn't very good, the receiver. But uh, it was back in the day, this was yeah, sort of top band mobile setup, uh, lightweight, small kit. And Kodar, very collectible now, considering how simple they are. Um, very quickly, the kit revolution. Uh, and I love this kit as well. Love some of this stuff. The uh, Heath kit was in America. There were loads of different kits here, not so many. Heath kit were a massive company in the US. This is their works in Benton Harbor in the US. Absolutely normal. They made everything, a kit for everything. You name it, they made it. If you download a Heath kit catalog from back in the 60s, 70s, they made everything from organs to uh, car stuff to have radio to music to televisions to hi fi. Absolutely staggering amount of kit and a ham radio kit. Uh, they uh, made AM kit early on, but quickly got onto the SSB bandwagon a little bit later. But they got on there quick with their uh, with their uh, HW and SB, which 
uh, now known as sugar baker and hot water. I know not why. The, somebody somewhere in the US came up with that. Um, and their claim was when you got the kit, it would always work. You, you know, you could send it back to them, but they'd get it working if you bought the kit. The thing about Heath kit gear is uh, it not only wasn't great value, this is their early top uh, AM transmitter. Um, fantastic, but in the bow tanker style with a bow tanker weight. Uh, there's whole nets of these sometimes on 80 meters in the UK for people that own them. Uh, but they, they quickly moved into SSB. This is my SB102. In America, they call it the poor man's Collins. I, I, it, topology is different from a Collins, but we won't go there no time. But an SSB transceiver kit, I've got several of them. They work great. This is their lower cost one. They're slightly cut down called the HW. I've got several of these. They work great. The good thing about restoring and rebuilding Heath kit gear is the manuals are fantastic. If you build one from a kit, every nut bolt from the opening the box to lining it up at the back, you know, aligning your, what, your radio, everything is covered. Every nut and bolt, every component, everything is explained. You don't want for anything if you want to restore one. What you are fighting if you rebuild one is not only the fairly basic design, but you're fighting probably the builder who may not have been that good with the soldering iron. I speak from bitter experience of miswiring and broken wires, but I know complete nutters, uh, uh, probably they're around the world, but in this country, there's a couple of complete nutters who go to the back of the book and take it apart backwards, a whole radio, and then uh, repopulate the boards with more modern components and maybe make the wiring loom with more modern wiring and then build the whole thing forward all over again. So that's that's another nerdy thing to do. But the manuals, uh, if you get a Heath kit, bit of kit with a manual, any of the SWR bridges, power meters, you name it. If you get the manual, you can download it. It's uh, fantastic. So as we move towards the last 10, 15 minutes of this presentation, um, and we move into the 60s, there's, there's um, uh, there's companies that I haven't mentioned, you know, Swan. I've just been playing with the Swan radio today. Hammerland and Hallicraft is great American companies. Tom Withers, who uh, I know, I have one of his radios here. TW from uh, Enfield. Uh, Tom is sadly silent key now the last three or four years. But the world was a changing uh, in many, many different ways uh, in the 60s, not only in the ways pictured there, but uh, in the ham radio as well. Not least because those pesky transistors were now making their presence felt in just about every bit of electronics kit uh, available. And some of the companies that I've just spoken about were a little bit slow, British and American and one or two other companies were too slow to spot how the world was going to change. Um, and the world changed because of one or two key individuals. I can't cover them all. This is one particularly key individual, this is Sarko, JA1MP, uh, founder of Yesu. Uh, if you, um, uh, he's, he's pretty much, he started off uh, in, in the 60s, pretty much the same um, um, outlook for his company that, that Drake and KW and a number of others were, which was to make off-the-shelf home radio kit for your domestic market. Nothing uh, particularly, you know, uh, unusual in that. Uh, however, uh, possibly with the help from the Japanese government or possibly, you know, because of the, the people that he employed, they quickly started innovating and looking at a global market, uh, which perhaps um, KW and maybe Drake didn't quite see. Uh, and I mean, a real global production capability uh, and uh, keeping the price down, keeping the quality up. Uh, and Sarko and the company, along with um, Areas from 1959 started small and quickly grew. Uh, and again, like um, so many other companies, he came up with the iconic name FT, which was dubbed Fox Tango. Again, I think it must be the US guys that dubbed it Fox Tango. Uh, the Fox Tango line, which have lived, of course, until you know, right to the present day. Uh, and he, uh, in the background, uh, there were other uh, Japanese companies, Trio, which became Kenwood and Inui, which became ICOM, there are others. Uh, and they uh, started to make their presence felt 
at the International Bar Kit with um, Radio Kit. Now, if you ever buy radio, a Japanese radio, FT-1000 or an FTDX-101 or any of them with MP suffix on the end, it doesn't mean anything other than when to Sarko died untimely, I think really in 1993, uh, they stuck, um, they brought out a variant of the FT-1000, they put MP on the end of it. It's in homage to to their to uh, Sarko as it was JA one MP it doesn't mean any anything te technical and you're still doing it now aren't they the FTDX one hundred one has got an MP suffix appended to it so uh, you know his 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 call sign lives on even even today which I think is a fantastic thing so he, he, they got moving very very quickly uh, and I wanted to get the price down the quality up and they wanted to innovate no other radio probably um, Probably um, embodies that that innovation quite as much as the uh, as the FT one hundred one. Although there were transceivers before it, um, the FT one hundred one uh, was was the one that sort of became iconic. Produced in absolutely phenomenal numbers, hundreds of thousands of these radios were produced. I, I've been working on. I've got three of this particular model in my workshop at the moment, uh, and they were groundbreaking. Word has it that Roly at KW got hold of one and realised that the number was up, that the, the game was up rather for Valve HF gear. Uh, extremely well, uh, well made. Uh, modular plug-in boards, which was very unusual for the time. Permeability tube front end, linear VFO, sweep tubes, AC and DC power supply built in. Later models with the power, uh, noise blanker and um, uh, a speech processor built in and the, re the the reality was you could just have the radio in one box no power supply required you can have the radio in one box a microphone 12 volts dc or mains whatever voltage uh and at an area and you could be on uh, the adverts showed you know in the overhead locker of, a, of an aircraft at the time pick it up take it away quite quite you know quite different and you know, started off with quite a few uh, problems, but uh, the, the Japanese uh, engineers listened, the Acer engineers listened, and gradually worked through the problems uh, with design mods and updated massive numbers. And of course, the, the, the FT-101 lives again today. Uh, and I love them. I absolutely love these radios because you can pull a board out and you can sort the boards over with another radio or you can change a part. Uh, relatively easy to work on. Uh, and the workshop manual means they're pretty pretty easy to align, a lot, a, lot, a lot of alignment, but I love them. Um, uh, everything built in, good quality parts, uh, Fox Tango Club, and numbers, astronomic numbers made. Uh, when you look at the, the production line, you compare it to KW here where I lived uh, in their fairly Dickensian sort of factory. This, you know, this is uh, you know, sort of just in time uh, quality manufacturing where the whole business of producing these transceivers globally and all the kit uh, is, is a world apart from probably uh, a lot of the other uh, companies. And that's eventually we know that uh, they, uh, they become an absolutely dominant in the ham radio market. So the Japanese invasion really uh, goes on and the big three came to dominate. Uh, uh, the FT-101E became the FT-101Z. I love these, still fairly heavyweight, uh, but I love them, relatively easy to work on. Uh, great performance, beautiful receiver, good audio. Uh, again, getting quite collectible these days. A little FT200, I love these. Some, some uh, certainly the US stations deride them as, as cheap CB light radios, but uh, I love them. They are communicating around the world on them. A uh, little simple printed circuit board, uh, quite powerful uh, valve uh, transceiver. It's not, not the best quality in the world, uh, but uh, uh, I love them. Um, they were sold in a number of different variants in the US and in Europe. Uh, Trio Chem Wood came out with a fairly uh, an iconic line, the TS830, again, highly prized now. An IF shift notch, uh, variable bandwidth, uh, fantastic uh, bits of kit, extremely well made, a lot of wire wrap in, in the Chem Woods. And a lower cost version to the TS520. A mate of mine bought one at a silent key sale yesterday and immediately called me on 40 meters on it without doing anything to it. Um, but uh, fantastic, uh, amazing bits of kit you can still buy and work on relatively, if you go to a relatively reasonable price. 
And that and the linear work every every bit of DX you want. Okay, you're not going to have a contest, narrow bad performance, but you know, on 80 meters or 40 meters, uh, or even at any bad 10 meters, you, know, you you can work on the stations that anybody else can work, uh, give or take. Uh, which is why I love them so much. Uh, I've got this one, FT901902. Everything in the kitchen sink in this radio. Uh, the joke is that in the year this came out, uh, Drake was still advertising their valve TR4 transceiver, which is just light years behind, at least two generations behind. And there was the AC with this thing with uh, the kitchen sink in it. Fantastic receiver, proper AM, proper FM, uh, Kia built in, tune up timer, uh, APF notch, CW filter. I'm just key. They're just. Just a fantastic bit of kit, and I, I've got an FT902 and I love it. Complicated bit of kit, but again, all plug-in boards. Uh, ICOM never really dallied too much with the valves. They had a go. There is some very early ICOM kit with valves in, but they quickly switched over to entirely transistorized, including the output, which means I haven't really worked on much of this stuff because um, certainly the older kit, because the, uh, the, the, the level of integration required uh, everything's crammed in. They really wanted everything small. So everything is crammed in, uh, which makes it quite hard to work on. Uh, yeah, some of the early icon gear, but of course they have now become uh, uh, a top, top, top uh, uh, flight uh, communications company for ham radio gear. So I don't really count this much as so much as it's, it's old ham radio kit, but it's harder to work on for me. Um, and rigs have gradually got smaller and lighter. Maybe it's the end of the bow tanker. I know the FTGX 101 is, is heavy. So just running to the end, then why do we do any of this, bring all this old kit back to life? Well, those of you that do it, if you are on this call, you know, is it, for me, it's memory lane. Um, when I was 15, 16 or 17, that isn't me, by the way, listening to my parents' shortwave radio and buying the magazines while they bought them for me. I, I, you know, I was at that period in my life where I was absolutely uh, uh, consumed with wanting to know about this kit, reading about the stuff that I couldn't own. And now I'm older in the last 20 years. I go back to that, that golden period, you know, perhaps we all go back to that age, 15, 16, where we become consumed with with some, some uh, hobby or other. And then we want to go back there. Uh, that's me. You might have a different view of it. So there is me. What did I want? I wanted to own a Fender Stratocaster. I've got about six of them now, and I play in bands all the time. So I've sort of got back there as well. You know, I wanted to own a, a sports car. I've got a Mazda MX-5, which is red. And so I've gone back to that as well. I wanted to play like the Beatles. I can play all this stuff now, but you know, I've got back there. And I wanted to own these radios that are advertised in the magazines, and now I do. So maybe that's what it is for me. You may have a different view, but you know, I've gone back to that sort of golden period where, uh, you know, just just from the child to adult, where it's absolutely consumed and wanted all these things. And these magazines were like I ate them. You know, I could recite every word in every advert because that's all I had. And a few old radio ham friends who are probably younger than I am now. You know, hello lad, come in and look at my my old gear. Uh, so now I own all this stuff and I've restored it. And I could go up to London and look in the, in the surplus shops. And even then I couldn't afford much. Uh, and we can wander around in London when you could back then as a kid, you know, different world back then, around, around Soho, because that's what my parents thought they didn't know. Uh, looking at there were all these surplus shops around the country, but loads in London. So what well, yeah, about buying and fixing all this stuff? Well, if you're going to buy it, you know, research is the thing. Uh, most of the manuals are available online for old kit. Amazingly, you, know, you can buy an old bit of equipment, a consumer hi-fi, and you can't get a manual for it anywhere. But most of the ham radio kit manuals are available online. Not all of them, but I've not really had any trouble with anything finding the uh, the stuff. There's people like VMARs and clubs um, who um, will help uh, parts and uh, research and um, uh, a lot of older people don't like the internet and its forums and its groups. Uh, I have a slightly different view. My view is you make it work for you. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I use them as required to find parts and get information. Yeah, sure, you get some idiot replies like, you know, my uh, idiot questions like my, I had them. Uh, my Drake TR4 will stop transmitting. What could be the problem? <laughs> I'm, I kid you not. I've had to give up with a guy in Canada who keeps on emailing me about um, 
an FT200, you know, why does it make this whistling noise? How the bloody hell should I do? Go out and scope and start working on it. It's not fair. The poor guy doesn't know what he's doing. But I make it work for me. So I, I switch off what is not necessary. Uh, and people come to me for advice and I try and help them if I can. But you do get some ridiculous, stupid questions. Um, do you really refer, re refer, repair, restore? Refurb is like getting the thing up to a reasonable standard. Repair is just getting it going. Complete restoration, you know, that means nuts and bolts, repainting the cabinet, cleaning all, you know, cleaning, taking all the chassis components out. It depends on your, your outlook. Uh, switches and mechanical things, always a problem in old gear, will always oxidize uh, and will always catch you out first before anything else, pots and switches. They will always catch you out every single time because mechanical parts tarnish and stop working properly. Uh, and most of the time, they're relatively easy to repair. Not always, uh, but most of the time, or you have to go searching for spare parts. Resistors, well, they're horrible. Uh, good quality ones uh, will last well. Cheap and cheerful ones will go up in value. Uh, but in most valve gear, you can check them in circuit. So uh, it's not uh, too difficult and they're relatively cheap to buy. Uh, uh, with some limitations. Capacitors, well, that's a presentation in itself. These are the famous Hunts capacitors derided 50 years ago. I hate them. Some people uh, still think they're quite good, but I find them leaky and horrible when I change them. Electrolytic capacitors, that's a presentation in itself. Um, I don't automatically change every single one, but I normally change the ones which have been under stress, high voltage ones. And again, modern ones are pretty cheap and they're small. Uh, and uh, relatively, uh, relatively, I've had no real problems uh, buying and restoring kit. Uh, valves seem to go on forever, remarkably long lived, remarkable. Uh, if they work, they seem to carry on working. Yeah, I've had the odd broken pin and low emission, but amazingly, they just are incredibly long lived devices. I'm constantly amazed at them. Uh, transistors are not always incredibly long lived. I've got a radio which has been overvolted at some point in its previous life, and a number of transistors have gradually failed, uh, gradually failed. Uh, but again, uh, most of them, uh, the kit that I'm repairing are, are, are easily available. Out RF output transistors from a more modern kit, really expensive and uh, easy to blow up and then you're back again, whereas valves, if you uh, output valves, if you uh, if you overheat them, the chances are you haven't killed them. And once you get into these things, LSI chips uh, in synthesizers uh, and complicated face lock loop arrangements, then I tend to steer clear of them. So uh, I do do quite a lot of restoration. That's KW2000, fully repainted and re, re, uh, reworked. Um, I like doing that. Uh, the big big issue uh, for me is, um, is safety. Uh, uh, I've seen some real uh, horrible things. Uh, bodgers in years gone by shouldn't have been near, near an electric driller solder or a, or a paint spray because they do things like this. Stick something inside a radio. That's a Boots transistor radio IF strip stuck in an FT101. Said the, or this relay hanging out the bottom of a swan. Why do they do it? What are they trying to achieve? So that's it. That's the last slide coming up here. Why do we do it? Well, it's fun, I think. It's a challenge and achievement. You learn a skill. You don't do it. I can't. I did 20 years ago. I couldn't do what I do now. And the reality is SSB, AM, CW and RTT. Why well, they haven't changed, have they? 60, 70 years. So they actually work quite well on this old kit with no menus. Um, and I defy anybody to know what radio I'm on. They probably would spot it if I drift a bit, but I'll let them have that. Uh, but, uh, but other than that, nobody really knows. Uh, I love the social history of the people that designed them, built them. Uh, I just love that aspect. Uh, and is it a bit like owning an old car? You can own a Morris Miley, can't you, and, and tinker with it and go to the shop and like driving it. Or you can buy a Tesla and just, you know, turn the key, don't even do that, just get in and press the pedals and you go. So is it like is it like owning something old and wanting to fettle it? I don't know. That's, that's my take. You've got my take on, on, on all this old ham radio kit. Hope you've enjoyed the presentation and uh, got something out of it. Uh, sorry, I haven't covered every damn radio on, on the planet, but there wasn't time. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Steve. Um, David Shaw has asked a couple of questions in the chat there, which yeah, are my uh, mate Dave. <laughs> Uh, which is your favourite make to work on? Oh, oh that's, that's, that's impossible, Dave. That's impossible. <laughs> go on, have a go. Not for you, no, no, not I for love, you. you know me, Dave. You know me for years, mate. I love the KW gear. I can get to every component. Great answer. Um, if you could only keep one. Oh, no. Guys, come on. <laughs> it's a KW, great question. KW, which KW, one would you keep? And why? KW 2000B. Why? Because I can get to every component. I know every single resistor in it. And I can get you know, on a desert island. I can even repair that filter, you know, just the, I, on the desert island, I could use it. Fabulous. And, one, bo and one book. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the book. Yeah, that, that's been, yeah, I don't need a service manual. I can find my way around without it. <laughs> so I've, I've got a question. You mentioned um, the MOD, and I think you mentioned training with the MOD. Were you by any chance an Aquila apprentice? Who's that asking? Jonathan. Yes, I was, Jonathan. So was I. What year? And, and Alan Betts as well. Oh, I know Alan. Uh, yeah, I know, you? yeah, but he was an apprentice as well. What year were you? Uh, very early 80s. Oh, right. I was 1970 intake. Oh, there you go. And I left in 1983 and joined the Met Police as um, a comms, comms engineer uh, because the MOD were going to move. Quillen was going to be disbanded and moved. Possibly to, oh, quite a few of my friends ended up in Bristol. Uh, and there were thoughts they might end up at Teesside. And I just got married and I wanted to stay in London. So my Aquila buddy, Paul Glaster, who's a 66 intake, I think, he came to see me and said, you want a job in the Met and secure comms? And I said, can I take my pension? And he said, yeah. So I, I uh, left, uh, left the MOD. Yeah, but I, I played with Klansmen. I had a great time with the MOD, playing with all the kit. Me too. <laughs> me too. Um, yeah, I did have one other question, if I may, while I've got you, as it were. Um, some of these old radios, I'm guessing, particularly the military stuff, doesn't use the same mains as us. So... How many of the radios you've got do you have to have some fancy schmancy power supply? No, only only a couple. Um, only a couple because I I haven't got much military gear here. Um, uh, the only the only ones that need eight different mains voltage are the American ones. Right. Uh, that's a two forty to one fifteen, you know, dropper. You sure. know, uh, but uh, yeah, some of the uh, clansmen and, and the rest of it. Well, it's battery powered. The uh, the uh, the 320 clans but are battery powered uh but yeah if people need 48 volts at, you know or aircraft 400 hertz or whatever then uh, i'm sure they've got clever ways of doing it but um, it's not for me no indeed okay um thank you anybody else got any questions please Don't yeah shut. if i could if i could just uh, Hi, David. make a comment and uh, and uh, ask a question um i'm uh, a long way from most of you i think i'm out in south devon uh, and I do have a number of older radios, including a 75A4. Have you? Yeah, oh, which brilliant. was fully restored by Howard Mills. And those of you who've looked at Collins, Howard Mills is the man for restoration. It's yeah, yeah. described as mu museum quality. Um, you mentioned that they uh, were very expensive, and indeed they were, um, but they're worth a lot less these days. Yes, yeah. Yeah, but there you go. It's a beautiful radio. Um, you did a nice review of uh, many of the radios that I have owned over the years, particularly <laughs> starting with 19 set and AR88 and stuff like that. Um, you didn't mention the FT401. I, I actually have the original FT505, which was the summer camp yeah. version, yeah, 1472. Uh, what do you think about those, Steve? I've got an FT401 right here. Uh -huh. uh, I've got one right on the floor here. Oh, right. Um, it seems to, yeah, well, there's, what am I going to say about the FT? When the FT400 came, for those on this call, uh, you know, the F, uh, Yesu, one of the things that Yesu targeted in about 1966, I think 67, was to bring out a valve transceiver which could run a bit of power, a bit more power. Uh, and they came up with, uh, with a, a, I think, of the FT400. Uh, which had 
so you six KD six sweep tubes, of which I've got a few here spares, mm -hmm. uh, which they would claim all the way through the variance of it would run like 500 watts input. So, you know, 250, 300 watts out. And those early FT400s are really uh, on a big printed circuit board um, were actually quite nice. What they did after that, when they brought out the, the 560, the 401, and you've talked about the 505, I've got the 401 here, is they started to add things to it. They started to add an AM, an AM ball, but without an AM filter. Uh, I got there's a blender in mine, I think, or a speech processor. And they started to add mm. things, and they changed the the layout of the front panel, but it didn't change the board. So they started to modify the board underneath. Mm. You know, like the AGC is now under the board, the, the voltage regulator, the six volt voltage regulator, they changed it. And all they did was cut tracks and glue things underneath. If only they brought out another revision of the printed circuit board, you know, a B or a C. So in restoring my 401 here, it's a big agricultural, funny little brackets, only the, the AM board that yeah. wobble about. Um, and not brilliant quality components back then either. Um, having said all that, I'm amazed that on 40 meters, I can beat 200 watts. I've, I've, I build my own watt meters and calibrate them with a the scone. Mm. Uh, I can beat 200 watts PEP output on my 401 easily uh, with the 6KD sixes in it. You've got to be careful, but and, and it, it basically works quite well despite being fairly agricultural in some ways but they really just modified it david you know right. you know what i mean from an early yeah, quite yeah. nice design they just started gluing things in and in a way i wish they'd sort of kept the pure design that they come up with you know they fiddle with the if they fiddle with the yep. vfo frequency yep. they fiddle around with it a lot which makes restoring them a bit of a pain um once they got into like the ft 101 you know, the, the FT101B and the E and the E and all the rest of them, they stuck, you know, they still modified the board, but they stuck with the design, of, uh, you know, a bit more. But um, and I've got an FT100, 150 as well. That's yeah. a germanium transistors, that's real big to work on. Uh, but yeah, I like the 401 and I've had an FR400 here as well. And the FL400, uh, the F, I mean, they were great bits of kit. But I think they were just getting their act together. Uh, for a global, you know, really good quality stuff. But yeah, I like the 401. It works yeah. amazing. I'm amazed it works as well as it does. Yeah, I look inside <laughs> it and think it should work this well, really. No, it, 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 it puzzled me why it was so higgledy piggledy inside. And now you've explained that. Yeah, they. It was my first commercial rig, uh, commercial transceiver in 72. And it's got me 200 countries on 80 meters. Yeah, I mean, into, really into a 100 foot wire. Yeah, uh, you know nothing because uh, it would run two hundred watts, which was a lot of power in those days. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Was okay, it might be worthwhile trying to restore it then because it's it's currently not working. It's been out of use for about thirty years. Well, yeah, I was given mine. I've got the VFO and the speaker. Sorry, not the clock. Yeah. Everybody else up there. I was given mine about five years ago uh, by uh, Tim M Zero AFJ, who is oh, down yeah, near you. Yeah, I know, I know Tim well, quite well. Well, he's my mate. Um, right. Uh, ah, right. <laughs> so it's his. Okay. He gave me an FT. He gave me a KW when he moved from Milton Keynes, where we lived. Yeah, to, down to, to Helston. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I met him. I met him at the Albert Hall. Actually, there's a long story of the folk rock band playing. And we, we met, and uh, he said, "You are my old kit. I'm moving to Devon, or Cornwall." And I, and I said, "All oh, right, then, Tim." Because he used to live here. He used to live in uh, yeah, Kent, yeah. He used to live in Mepham. and. Uh, Anyway, I, dro I drove up to uh, have lunch with him, but then I've been up a couple of times uh, when he's been up uh, and he's come back. Uh, and he said, I've got an FT401, do you want it? I think it's it fits blind the maze fuses. So I said, all right then. So it's five years ago, I drove up in November <laughs> and bought it. And when I got it back, the uh, you know the high voltage board? Yeah. Underneath you with all the diodes on it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I put a fuse in and, and I couldn't see anything seriously wrong. So I turned it on and there was a, there was a bright light on that board under the board uh, and the fuse went. So I took the board out and the, the board had carbonized 
from the 900 volts or 800 or whatever it is to the screw that holds it in. And we reckon there must have been some moisture in the board, in the Paxilene, because it's quite mm. a long way to carbonise. Uh, so I took the board out and I cleaned it, uh, you know, till it wasn't. And I put it all back together and the radio came on uh, and it didn't get back anymore. So I emailed him and said, do you want a contact? I got it going like two days yeah. later. Uh, I've got the VFO here on the floor and the speaker. So I've got the whole line up. Right, yeah, that's the setup I have. Anyway, but, I don't uh, want to hide yeah. uh, on, on that subject. But, and then uh, it, it failed it again. Yeah. A few yeah. months, in fact, last year it failed again. The same, this time the fuse went again, but no, no flash and a bang. So it was those high voltage diodes. I changed them all for, you know, 5408 or something. Or, yeah. Uh, and I changed them all and, and operation was restored. I changed the filter capacitors as well at the same time. Um, so... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. diodes, I had a lot of problem with diode failures. Uh, my KW Atlanta, which is a copy mm. of the Swap 500, that failed during the KW uh, demonstration weekend. And that was, I. we just popped around the, my mate's house, got some diodes and restored, re, you know, at the, at the special event station, soldered it up and it was back on. So those old diodes, you know, that they use, the high voltage ones, they're, uh, they do get a bit stressed, uh, I find oh. it. Uh, that's useful to know. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but I'm, yeah, bringing it up is a bit scary because I mean, you know, it's some, you know, nine hundred volts. Uh, you know, probably, you know, the peak. Well, it can easily manage an amp, probably, couldn't it? Uh, Eight hundred yeah. volts. Um, so mm. uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I love the Paxilin uh, carbonisation story. You managed to get the magic smoke back into the box. That's not something you think very... <laughs> yeah. 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 Any more questions from anybody? Has anybody got an old <coughs> radio that hasn't been mentioned? Uh, well, I got just one uh, a question. Uh, oh, you've got the screen share there. Oh, you've come back now. Yeah, i got just one question. It's uh, Peter, G3, I'm all right. Hi, Peter. Um, yeah, uh, just a couple of names, which uh, a couple of companies which were very short lived, I think. Millimeter yes, and Panda millimeter. Radio. Have you ever come across uh, anything? Uh, I've, I've looked over the years, never seen anything advertised. What was the other one you mentioned? Uh, uh, Panda Radio and Millimeter. Panda, yeah, Panda, yeah, Panda, Panda Cub. I've been after one on and off for a long time. There is very Oh, yeah, um, Robert's got Swan 240. Yeah, I'll talk to you. Um, yeah, the pandas, very little information about them. My, my uh, G2WI, who I listened to as a kid, he had a panda cub and I wanted one. Um, I've not been able to get hold of one. They do pop up from time to time on eBay and V-Miles auctions. And very occasionally you see them. Uh, the mini bit is like the MR44 or something I remember. Um, drawing over back back then as a kid because they made a vfo and all sorts didn't they they they've not they've not popped up very often very rarely see them at a rally if ever and you see most of the other kit you know that the drakes and all, all of the british companies but the, it's quite rare to see some of that kit peter now it, it, it is disappearing possibly i'm not sure it's disappearing without a trace but it's 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 rare now. This is why I don't mention it in the presentation. Because you know, Tiger is another one. Tiger is another company that made uh, made gear back then, uh, uh, and uh, SSB products made a thing called the Sphinx, which I've had uh, trans very weird stuff. But there were there were quite a few of these little companies knocking around, but I, I, they didn't quite get the uh, get into the the level of manufacturing that KW did. So, yeah, yeah, I think that, um, as I say, uh, from what I remember, millimeter were quite expensive. It was a receiver and a separate transmitter. Yeah. Uh, Panda, I didn't know very much about. But I, no, I my, that was the Panda you, Cup, yeah. Yeah, yeah was, and Tiger, you juggle memory with Tiger, that was the other one I was trying to think of. Yeah, Tiger, But yeah. Uh, they were pretty, uh, pretty short-lived and uh, yeah. quite expensive. I was, and yeah, lab I was gear. You've got the lab gear, of course. Oh, yeah, lab gear. Yeah. 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 Uh, the LG 300 is the most famous one, but it's a separate modulator and that. Um, oh, I mean, yeah. I can't get them all in. I'll be in a, a two hour presentation before. <laughs> yeah. yeah, indeed. 
Anyway, I'm going to say thank you very much for your presentation. Yes, Enjoyed Peter, it very yeah. much. Um, I've been sitting here and uh, I've uh, I broke my uh, thigh, so uh, I'm recovering from that. So I'm going to get All off right, my, my shack you. chair and say good night to everybody. And thanks very Cheers, much. Well, thanks very much. Uh, lovely to see you, Peter. And Robert, Robert, KW24, uh, uh, Swan240, Robert said he had there that. Um, I, I nearly bought a couple of those from the US a few years ago, but um, I think the on eBay they wouldn't ship to the UK. So um, I've restored a, um, a Swan 500. I've had a couple of contacts on it today, Swan 500. Uh, KW copied the Swan 500 exactly. And made a thing called the KW Atlanta. Um, there's very little difference. In fact, I use the Swan service manual to repair the uh, KW Atlanta because there's no different. The layout is different, but the circuit is identical. Hmm. Can so, I can I just come in? Don't be. Yeah, Steve. Thanks very much for the talk, which I found fascinating. Um, especially when you got to the Marconi CR100, yeah. which was my, my first ever radio. I popped across the river in London into Lyle Street. Yes. And, and <laughs> come staggering home. I think I must have used a push chair across Waterloo Bridge. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and that was, it, that was, I was, I was entranced at the time, you know, but, and, and I, I actually used that in 63. November 63, when Kennedy got assassinated, suddenly the TV went blank. And I was all I had was a, a one bedroom flat in Waterloo and just a long wire around the uh, skirting board, not the skirting board, around the the uh, the picture board at the top of the, the room. And I was able to, 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 to pick up uh, the American stations and get information before the BBC had even thought about it, you know, which is oh, good. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, cheers. Brilliant. So, okay, uh, Andy, uh, so quickly, Andy said he's got Hammerland HQ100 in awesome yeah. condition. Yeah, it's yeah. great stuff. Brilliant. Okay, uh, any final questions? Uh, as, uh, I'd like to say to Steve, as an old G3 once said to me and after and over, almost interested. Oh, thank you very much, Andy. I'll take that <laughs> then. I think all, all most interesting. <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, right. Then. Well played, Andy. Sure well played. Said, I'm not sure what he meant when he said it to me. <laughs> um, okay, well, from me and everybody else, I don't know if Andy wants to say a few words, so I'll give it over to him afterwards. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much, Steve, um, fellow ex Aquila apprentice. Yes. Um, really <laughs> very interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot, um, John. Put a lot of work into putting that material together. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, Andy, over to you. Okay, cheers, Steve. Just to um, to echo what others are saying, it's been a brilliant night. Thanks very much. No problem. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting you back again. Okay, Andy. Well, you, you get well, you guys. And uh... oh, yeah. Cheers, Steve. Thanks. Yep, see you soon. Bye, all. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Bye -bye. Steve. Are you stopping the recording, Andy?